Yeah. Okay, so today we have Keiichiro Furuya, who's going to talk about the quantum error correction. Uh, once again, we are continuing with the FTH motion at club. So try to uh, stay muted and they say you want to say something and uh, I guess you can put the camera or not, that's the same, I think. But okay, go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Kate Shirofuya. Um I'm a, a student of NEMA and uh, working on uh, some uh, quantum information and quantum gravity stuff. And today I'm, I want to talk about operator algebra, uh, algebra quantum error correction. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is more uh, unlike a talk of research materials, but it is more like a mini lecture on operator algebra quantum error correction. Okay, so um, first I'm gonna briefly talk about quantum error correction uh, in, uh, in the usual way that we have you, maybe you guys have seen in the textbook of Preskill or Nelson and Tran, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, operator algebra quantum error correction. Okay, so basically uh, the system that we are considering is not the closed system; it's the open quantum system. So the system is in the back, and we consider the physical system. Uh, undergoes this process so that the system and the bat couples afterwards. And then the interactions between system and bat uh, can be considered as a noise introduced to the system. That's something we're gonna see later on. Okay, so why quantum error correction? So in uh, quantum error correction now, nowadays are a very important idea uh, in non-relativistic quantum physics and also in uh, relativistic quantum physics, uh, quantum relativistic uh, physics. So in, uh, in non-relativistic quantum physics, we have many applications, quantum communications or quantum computers. Um, in one uh, uh, famous or uh, good uh, one, uh, famous studies or uh, topics are topological codes to, st to study how quantum computers should simulate physics uh, uh, without having errors on it, something like that. Um, even in holography, nowadays quantum error correction is important. One is in bulk construction. So, for example, I'll consider ADS3 CFT2 <coughs> case and take a, a, a time slice, constant time slice here. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's a statement then if you take, uh, so, so this is a constant time slice and take a local boundary, three uh, local boundary regions, A1, A2, A3. And there's a statement that if you uh, take the RT surface here of each one, uh, each corresponding boundary regions, the bulk operators inside here can be reconstructed or expressed using the boundary operators. Yeah, here, uh, for example, here, I1 of X. But <clears throat> if the bulk operator is, is inside of here, which is not covered of in, by the, any of the uh, bulk regions of here, here, or here, this bulk operator cannot be <laughs> um, uh, expressed or reconstructed by this local region, A1, or A2, or A3. So in this case, phi of x can be and then this can be said as um, uh, can, cannot be accessed by these boundary regions. In other words, if if, they, if there's anything happened to the boundary region, this phi of x is immune or it doesn't nothing to do. Uh, it, there will be no effects on phi of x or something like that. So the bulk reconstruction quantum error correction is somewhat related and people are studying, yeah, studying this. And also uh, people are studying this holography uh, using tensor networks and this tensor networks are uh, good, has a good relation with quantum error correction, which I'm not gonna talk about for today's talk. Okay. So um, those are the applications that uh, people are studying. And now we go back to a basics of quantum error correction. So when people say errors, 
um, the examples can be like this. So let's say uh, you have a single qubit system and the bit flip error can be represented by sigma x. This is the Pauli matrix. It's the, so if sigma x acts on your initial state zero, that gives you one. Or you can have a phase flip error that changes the relative phase of the state. So if your initial state is zero plus one, then sigma z um, acting on this system can change the relative phase of this state, which gives you a zero minus one. So these are the simplest examples of errors you can have. Now, uh, in order to correct these errors, we want to add redundancies to the system. So the system we had initially was a single qubit. Now we want to add the redundancies. So we uh, embed the single qubit to a three qubit system. So if you embed this single qubit system to three qubit system, you have zero state to zero, 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 and you, you map one, you embed one state one, pick to state one, two, one, one. So how this uh, correction works is that if the bit flip error acts on state zero, 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 then the uh, output state is gonna be zero, zero, one. And if you do the majority vote, then zero state zero zero is dominant, so you can easily guess that the initial state was zero zero. So you can do a um, correction to this system. So um, uh, the space that is spanned by this zero 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 or one 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 is called code subspace. And the, there is a similar space that is called logical space that is spanned by. 0m and 1l. This 0, 0l is just the renaming of these states. Okay. Uh, is there any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, what is the logical space in the holography example? Like, I think the redundancies are the three subregions, right? This a1, a2, a3. Ah, I see. Um, uh, this was in the previous slide. Yeah. So you're talking about this, right? Okay? Yes, yeah. so, um, yeah, so logical, so let's see. So in holography, logical space. Hmm. Sorry, do you uh, mean logical uh, operator? Yeah, or, or like the logical Hilbert, the logical state, like, like the set, the, so these physical, these logical states, I guess, is bad, some. Some some Hilbert space. So uh, you he he will he will talk about this more. But uh, basically, it's much easier to ask about logical operators. So that's why he's the the talk is going to be about logical uh, operator error correction. So here, phi of x is an operator that acts in the logical space. So it's a logical operator. Okay. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yes, so. so maybe maybe one, one uh, toy model you can think of is the three qubits uh, model for holography. So in this case, you have uh, three qubits as like single qubits, a single qubit for each boundary regions and uh, called logical space is gonna be renaming of those um, uh, three qubits, uh, specific three qubit states. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we can discuss this uh, afterwards. I can tell you more about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I have a question of uh, of the last slide? So, um, yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 this one. Yeah. Uh, so previously you said if you have a phi one, then you can reconstruct this operator from a two. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think you said if it's phi, then you cannot reconstruct it. Uh, I think it's, you cannot reconstruct it either from A1, A2, or A3. But if I'm considering, so, so my question is, if I'm considering a large region, for example, if I'm considering A1 and A2 together, so oh. is that possible for me to reconstruct it, the, uh, the phi x for this operator? Yes, yes. OK. For, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I Thank you. Mm. OK. So yeah, so those are the basic ideas of errors and code subspace. But in order to discuss uh, more, uh, in order to discuss operator quant algebra quantum error correction, we want to have 
sophisticated formulation of errors. So <clears throat> it's something we're gonna do now. So as we have discussed, uh, we have an open quantum system. So we have a system here and back. And we consider the unitary time evolution for the whole system back and system both. The, we will have a density, final density matrix of the of BAP and system. And so now we want to find what the final density matrix of the system. The way to do is schematically like this. So you take, uh, take the partial trace over BAP degrees of freedom. So you can have density final density matrix on the system. And if you play around with this thing, you can finally, uh, you, you can, define a map that is called quantum channel or a completely positive tracing, uh, trace preserving map. And <laughs> this is the core of core object of uh, operator algebra quantum neural correction. And this uh, map has several representations, but in, our, in here, we're gonna consider representation, so-called Krauss representation. And this MK is called Krauss operators. Now I want to uh, describe what completely positive and trace preserving are. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, let's discuss completely positive. So the completely positive, let's start with the positive map. Positive map maps positive operators to positive operators. In our case, density matrices. So the density, when I say positive operators, uh, it has a positive spectrum. In this case, it corresponds to probability. And we don't have a negative probability, we have positive probabilities. So density matrices we consider are positive operators. Now, <clears throat> uh, so when I say positive map, that means it uh, maps positive operators to positive operators. Then <laughs> when I say completely positive, that means it preserves positivity of the larger system. So what it means is that here, the map we're considering is only on the subsystem. You know, it's only on the system, not with the back. So it's acting on the subsystem. If you uh, so, if you consider a local operation on the system, the positivity of the whole system should preserve. That's the statement of this completely positive map. Because uh, if we can have completely positive map for the uh, larger system, that means that you will you might have negative probability for the larger system. And that, that doesn't make sense for the physical process. That's why we want to have completely positive map here. And uh, trace preserving means that the, uh, it preserves, this map preserves total probability of the density matrices. So the initial density matrix, uh, the total probability of the initial density matrix should be equal to the total probability of the final density matrix. And this is uh, using the cross operators, this statement is equivalent, equivalent to this <coughs> uh, expression. Sum over K is MK dagger times MK equals the identity of the system. Okay, uh, is there any questions so far? So what is K? So what is the physical meaning of this index K? Ah. Basically MK together basically maps the initial density matrix to the final one, but uh, okay, what? Mm -hmm. What really does this index mean, K? Ah, so uh, this index K is the uh, runs from one to so one. Uh, so this K runs from uh, runs through uh, bad degrees of freedom. So this K has uh, yeah yeah. That, that, that makes sense. So you, you mean it depends on the path? Okay, yes. So the the path may have, a uh, uh, single path may have uh, multiple ways uh, to, okay. So basically each K is, each MK labels a type of error that can happen. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Uh, so MK, yeah, each uh, describes the error that happens to the state. Okay, and this, uh, so this formalism of error is useful in quantum measurement um, as well because you have system and you have probe and you can couple them to this, uh, to measure the state of the system. So that was just a small comment. 
So the summary for the first part is that the errors can be formulated using the CPTP map and the class operators, which represent the noise. And uh, we have uh, also discussed the code subspace, which is the <laughs> subspace where initial states are submitted to error correction. Okay. So uh, from now, uh, we want to start discussing what the active and passive quantum error correction is. So uh, simply what the active quantum error correction is, uh, is, follow is as follows. So let the system undergoes a physical process E. So you have the initial density matrix row, and you consider the uh, noisy process represented by the CPTP map, curly E. Then after this error occurs, we want to correct that error using another CPTP map called recovery map. So in active quantum error correction, uh, we want to find uh, this recovery map to correct the error. So that's the thing. And, uh, however, in passive quantum error correction, what we want to do is to uh, find a subsystem that is immune to a uh, composite CPTP map. So in this case, E again introduces a noise to the system and R uh, is a recovery map. So, uh, so this name, so as, the, as the name suggests, first we, found, we, want, we want to find the subsystem that is immune to this CPTP map. And if we can encode those information to that subsystem, then this CPTP map does nothing to do that system anyway, even before and after the process. So that's why we don't even have to correct it, correct the errors because error doesn't happen to the system. So that's the basic idea of passive quantum error correction. And as I, um, so we will discuss this, but we have two pictures to consider. One is Heisenberg picture, and the second, uh, second one is Schrodinger picture. In Heisenberg picture for passive quantum error correction, given two CPTP maps, the goal is to find a correctable algebra, which we will define later. The correctable algebra brief is briefly a set of operators that is invariant under these two CPTP maps. And in the Schrodinger picture, we want to, uh, given E and R, we want to find a code subspace or the code subsystem, which we will define later on. Okay. So let's start with quantum active quantum error correction. So active quantum error correction, we uh, start with CPTP map and code subspace. So given a code subspace HC here, H is a whole Hilbert space on the uh, system. And CPTP map E. And PC here is the projection onto a code subspace. The code subspace HC is said to be correctable for CPTP map E if there exists a recovery map R. Okay. So this is the first process after the noise is introduced. And if, I, if you apply R, then you recover initial density matrix. And the condition here implies that the in, initial density matrix uh, lives on code subspace. So as we have discussed, the code sub subspace is a place where the initial state lives. Question? Yeah. Is this if and only if? So uh, for all row that are in the subspace, then it's true that uh, your RE of row, row is left invariant. But is it true that uh, if row is left invariant, then row lives in the subspace? Has this form? Um, um, said differently, I, are yeah. the only are the only invariant density matrices the ones that you've captured? Mm -hmm. uh, mm, mm, I think the answer is no. So if you start from this expression. Um, so you're asking whether uh, given E and R, and if you find the density matrix row, is that is the uh, is row lives in 
the cold subspace given at the initial? Yes. And I think the answer is no. There could be a multiple uh, cold subspace. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I want to ask a kind of philosophical question. Is this yes. E map uh, known or, or we are thinking like sometimes error can occur randomly, so you don't really know, or here E is something fixed for which you find R, or R is something that corrects any kind of random error? I, I don't understand that, that this philosophy. Uh, random, uh, what do you mean by random error? Can it be- uh, Like any... I connect to a thermal, no, like you said, sometimes a spin can flip, sometimes mm -hmm. it can be a phase, but I don't know exactly what's going to happen. So this E tells you exactly what's going to, what errors are yes. happening. Right. And then you yes. find out. No, I, I think it tells you a certain probability, Marcin. Uh, if you, the simplest case is when there's only one type of error, it means that your Krauss operators are only two. Okay, let's start with the case when Krauss operator is only one and it's just unitary. Uh, that means that no error happens. Uh, the density matrix evolves unitarily. Uh, the next would be uh, two Krauss operators. Once, one, let's say, proportional to unity for simplicity, uh, uh, but it's not equal to unity. Uh, the other is proportional to something else. For example, the first operator can be some number let's say alpha times unity, and the other will be some number, let's say beta times sigma x. Sigma x would be spin flip. Uh, so, right, right, something like that, yes. That's uh, exactly that, true, actually. So that E that he's writing packages all possible errors and their corresponding probabilities. That can so the first term should have alpha, just to be kind of maybe, you know, since we're talking about specific formula, there should be alpha, uh, some coefficient alpha in, in front of the first term with the, yeah, right. That means that probability alpha, uh, alpha squared or absolute value squared is probability that there is no spin flip and beta, mm -hmm. absolute value beta squared is probability that there is a spin flip. Uh, Actually, these are these are probabilities. You don't need to square them because you have. Oh square. right, that's really. Oh, let me. See. Let yeah, me yeah. Double. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. So my bad, my bad. It's already right because Kraus. It's it's. I, I was thinking in terms of Kraus. Yes, exactly, exactly. So this will be, right, 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 right. I, I, I was speaking about Kraus. Kraus would be alpha times unity, for instance. But in this form, it will be already uh, alpha squared. Yes, yes. Alpha plus beta must be equal to one. Exactly. Right. Uh, I don't know, so, but I think it's probabilistic. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if I'm answering Martin's question. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, thank you. No, I, so you know E, um, okay, good, thank you. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's probabilistic. That it, it, you're not saying that every uh, bit you send through the, uh, every instance you send through the channel will flip it. Exactly, this alpha and beta R. In fact, yeah, yeah, no, I think, no, I understand, but so you know this E and then you need to find R, but E is a known, you know these probabilities. Right. That's, then, that's how I, th that's how, right, that's, that's exactly my true. impression. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's exactly true. That's right, this is true. Okay. So all these class operators are unitary or not? Okay. Or okay. actually is some non-unitary opera operators are also not? This is not, this is not unitary operators. Class operators are not, not necessarily unital. Are so unitary? for example, uh, Chi, the, the Krauss operator corresponding to the first term would be square root of alpha times unit operator, which is not unitary. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It will be only unitary for alpha equal one, in which case it means that there is no error. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe one thing that uh, is worth mentioning is that so the form of the cross representation Kichiro wrote is a per, is a complete characterization of any CP map any T, CPTP map. So any CPTP map has this form could be written in this form. Any quantum evolution that is like an open quantum system can be written in this form. The form is non unique, but it definitely has that form. Yes, thank you. Okay. So <clears throat> now uh, what we want to discuss is um, 
uh, when this R exists and when this uh, cold subspace, when, uh, when the states in the cold subspace are correctable. So that condition is driven by this. So again, given a cold subspace and CPTP map with a projection onto a cold subspace, it is correctable if and only if this condition holds. And this uh, PC is projection onto cold subspace, like I said, and MK and ML are cross representation of given CPTP map. And lambda KL is this some number. Okay, so I'm, gonna prove, I'm not going to prove this, but I would like to uh, discuss the physical meaning of this condition. So uh, suppose uh, we can write down the projection uh, PC into this way, where this vector state CI is the state in cold subspace. Then in this case, you can um, uh, write, rewrite this condition uh, of left-hand side into this form. In order for this form to satisfy this con uh, condition for the correctability, this first term here should be lambda KL times delta IJ. So what this is doing is, uh, any question here? Okay. So what this doing is just looking at the overlap between two states after error occurred. So the, this cross operator represents the error. So cross operator acting on the states is gonna be the state after error occurred, okay? So <clears throat> this condition is looking at the overlap of these two states. So the first, uh, we can read off two uh, things. First is this. So this uh, is, uh, this is the case when the in initial states are different, and in this case, two in this case, two states, two initial states are the same. So, <clears throat> when two states are the different, it should be zero. This is the important point to <clears throat> have a correctability. So, what this says is that the different bases should always be distinguishable, even after an error occurs. Okay. So if this is not true, then error cannot be correctable. The example is as follows. So given a, a uh, cubic. Could you, could you go back to what CI and CJ are? CI and CJs are states in cold subspace. And lambdas are any complex numbers? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, for the, for, so if this doesn't hold, then um, we cannot correct the, uh, the errors. The example is as follows. So if you think of two qubit system, then let's assume that this, there's an error, sigma x tensor i acting on this state. This gives you state one zero. <laughs> but, we, uh, but we cannot guess uh, what the initial state was. Was it zero zero or one one? So in this case, um, obviously it is not correctable. So this condition is critical to have correctable cold subspace. Now the second condition uh, categorizes two codes. One is non-degenerate code, and the second is degenerate code. If uh, two states are distinguishable then we call it that a non-degenerate code. And if two states uh, here and here are indistinguishable, we say that code is correctable but degenerate code. Okay. Uh, sorry, I think I said complex, I, I said yes, uh, I said complex number for lambda k, but it should be real. Yeah. Uh, sorry, no, but for the when, when there is, for the off diagonal elements, there are complex numbers. Even even here, there are complex numbers, right? I mean, why why would it be real? Ah, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, so it's um, absolute body square sh can be it should be real, but it's complex number. Okay. In, in part A, maybe it it should be real because. It,
No, I, I don't. I don't think the only time that it has to be something is when it's it has to be positive, and that's when it's the norm of a state. If k and l are the same index, then it has to be positive because it's a probability. But yeah. otherwise, yeah. But Sergey is saying that in part a it says delta k n. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So in that case, it will be positive. Yeah, for this case. Uh... Yeah. All right. I mean, you could have written delta k, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, if you have a condition for when the recovery map exists, is there an explicit form for the recovery map? Um. Mm, I don't think so. The, so uh, a CPTV map can be represented in different representations. R can have different. I mean, in terms of the cross operators of E that you already know and probably. Oh, I um. Hmm. Uh, sorry, but this recovery map should be unitary. Or, I mean, something you should apply or not, or is just some theoretical thing. Uh, could you say that again? That the recovery map is something that you are supposed to apply, like a unitary transformation, mm -hmm. or is just some theoretical device that exists? Oh, it's the. Um, it doesn't have to be unitary operator, but it should uh, invert. It should invert all the errors introduced by the given CPTP map E. So the recovery map is also another CPTP map, right? Yes. Yes. So yeah, exactly. That's how you do it. So you bring in some ancilla qubits, you couple them together, you evolve it in a controlled way, and then you do, you throw out your ancilla. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so the example of the code is Joel's code. It's a nine qubit code, which is, which is correctable. So I shouldn't say you. It is correctable to bit flip and phase flip errors. And set of cross operators uh, we consider is xi and zi, which is has this form. So uh, zi has sigma z in i qubit. And this is a degenerate code. Okay, so for the summary for the active quantum error correction, um, uh, given cold subspace HC and the uh, CPTP map E, we uh, find the recovery map R. So that was, that's the idea of active quantum error correction. And the condition of the existence of recovery map is given by this. Okay, so now we, uh, I'm gonna talk about passive quantum error correction. So passive quantum error correction has two pictures, Heisenberg picture and Schrodinger picture. And we start with Heisenberg picture. Um, one reason is, be uh, is because the transition from Heisenberg picture to Schrodinger picture is very clear and it's easy to understand. And second reason is that in uh, the applications uh, I have in mind is to quantum field theory or holography, which has uh, which we deal with uh, field operators and those. So it's good to have Heisenberg picture uh, formalism so that we can apply this. However, what we are discussing here is only a finite system. So <clears throat> the app, the understanding of this formalism in infinite dimensional could be a future work. Okay. So the passive quantum error correction, we start with Heisenberg picture. The goal, uh, so the formalism is like this, given CPTP map, E and R, we, need, we want to find the correctable algebra. So the difference between active quantum error correction is that we are given CPTP map E, which represents the noise, and we have the cold subspace. But in this case, we and then find R. But in this case, we have E and R. Given. Sorry, what's the definition of correctable algebra? Ah, so that's uh, we're gonna uh, look at soon. 
Okay, thanks. So, so Heisenberg picture, the idea to find code uh, correct of algebra starts from looking at the expectation value. So let's say we have a CPT map E and observable algebra. And if you pick one observable, uh, to calculate the expectation value, we have this form, trace A of rho. Rho is the density matrix. Now, if we want to calculate the expectation value after the noise introduced to the system, we can calculate in this way, trace of A times E of rho. And uh, we want to uh, discuss Heisenberg picture. So we, want, we will look at this, uh, um, this form. So what, what, is, what has happened is that you consider the adjoint map of CPTP map E that acts on A. So in this case, the physical interpretation is that uh, here, noise is introduced to the density matrix row to the state. But in this picture, we can consider that the noise is introduced to observables. Now, uh, so E was CPTP. In this case, a joint map or dual map of E star, it becomes a unital CP map. When I say unital, that means that it maps identity to identity. In the case of quantum error correction, we have recovery and recovery map R and E both are given. So in this case, in Schrodinger picture, when you calculate the expectation value, it looks like this. And if you take the adjoint of two CPTP maps, you can have this form. So considering the action of E star, R star on observable is the main thing that we want to look at. So uh, to have more intuition, let's consider the spectral decomposition of observable. So uh, alpha i is the eigenvalue, and pi is the eigen, uh, eigen uh, spectral uh, projection. So if you use this expression, this can be written as this. Now, e star of, uh, if e star of pi is equal to pi, then the expectation value is invariant under e star. So this is the starting point to define correctable algebra. Okay, uh, is there any questions so far? Sorry, so you took your A to be self-adjoint? Yes. Is that a limitation or not? The, the limitation. Um, uh, well, we want to consider observables. So okay, that, yeah, that's kind of limitation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, before we uh, define corrective algebra, it's uh, nice to look at noisiness algebra, which is a uh, simpler version. So, <clears throat> uh, so we have seen this form, E star of PI equals to PI. And this spectral projection PI is, is noiseless or satisfies this form that we have just discussed if and only if PI commutes with all the class operators of uh, the class operators belongs to E star. So this is the condition. Now we consider uh, algebra generated uh, or, sorry, algebra spanned by the set of spectral projections that commute with all the cross operators. And that algebra we call it as noiseless algebra. So the element of this algebra or the operator commutes with MK and MK dagger. Uh, so I went on that. So M is not unitary, no? M is not unitary. But if you commute, you get M dagger M, and then what? Like if you go back, uh -huh. you go back one slide. So yeah, I see there in the crowd. So M, so M I commute it with P, but then I get P M dagger M and that, ah, sum over K. Ah, yes. So M sum, dagger M. Ah, okay, okay. It's a unit. Uh, so yeah, this is a unital map. So M K dagger M K is equal to identity gives you that. Okay, so the, this is the definition of noiseless algebra. So A is in the bound, it is a, yeah. Okay, 
So the correctable algebra can be uh, defined in a similar way. So we had only E star for noiseless algebra, but in this case, uh, in this correctable algebra, we consider E star or E star arm star comp composite TPTP map. And we consider that uh, we, we and then this theorem tells you that the spectral projection is correctable. It's not noiseless. No? So it's correctable if PI commutes with MK dagger and ML. And these MK and ML are, are cross uh, operators belongs to E star only. And we do the same procedure to generate the algebra that is called correctable algebra. So this is the, so the uh, operators in correctable algebra are invariant in, under E star R star. So we can say this is immune to, this uh, physics in correctable algebra is immune to uh, C, CPTP maps. Okay, so one comment about correctable algebra is that, <clears throat> so we have defined the correctable algebra in this way, but uh, you can define correctable algebra more uh, simple way, where uh, suppose you have this CPT, composite CPTP map phi star, which is just this, acting on some algebra. If this algebra inside here commutes with ML MK or commutes with MK dagger ML dagger, that's also the same thing. So this uh, definition of correctable algebra is same as this uh, definition of correctable algebra. So you can construct your correctable algebra either way. Okay. Any um, yeah. Can we find a equation relating the cross operators for the recovery map and the noise from this? Cross operators relating. Uh, so could, could you say that again? Uh, can you get a relation between N and M from this condition? From this condition? Yeah, so N, are the, N is a cross operator for the recovery map R, right? And uh -huh. M is the M is for the noise E. That's right. So if you have two equivalent conditions, is there a way of writing the recovery map in terms of the noise cross operators? Um, I, I, I think so. I don't have it on top of my head, but I no, guess. Actually, so here we are doing, we're in the passive picture, aren't we? So E is given, that mm -hmm. fixes E star for you. R is given, that fixes R star in, for you. So E and R are in principle two, grand, two completely uh, unrelated CPTP maps. Because it's given the data of the problem. In passive error correction, you're given E an R and the problem is find the sub uh, correctable algebra. Yes. I see. Um, and it's slightly confusing since the first definition does not even consider the recovery map R. Yeah, I did, I did not understand this step actually. Um, um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, there's some derivation and you can see that this, uh, uh, this definition does not have cross operators uh, of the recovery map. The reason why we have this MK dagger ML two cross operators due to the noise is the consequence of removing cross operators belong uh, due to the uh, recovery map. Yeah, maybe we could discuss this offline, but I, yeah. I have a okay. feeling that, yeah, it's a little bit, yeah, okay. Let's yeah, talk about uh, it. yeah I, can, I can show this uh, later, yeah. Okay, so this this was the um, <coughs> good uh, no, point. Sorry, I wanted no because if the correctable algebra looks like you can take n to be m dagger or something in the first. Yes. No. Yeah, you, you can take m. Okay, what, what, what? Uh, no, no. But sorry, I mean, m m k's and n l's are given in the problem. For no, 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 but I'm saying the first definition there is no n, but. If that's true, could I take NL to be ML dagger and say, well, I have some R? Yeah, I'm, I'm very confused about this slide actually, but. Um... Okay. 
Um, so, so I think I can understand your question about it. My okay. question? Uh, yeah, yeah, your question. I know, because I'm saying, suppose it's correctable algebra, means it's I assume for some E and some R, but the E seems to be given by the M's, but you don't have the N. Uh -huh. I'm just saying that if I define NL to be ML dagger, so that I, so I define that to be R, then in my, this is the correct for that. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, oh, I see. I think what is no. going on is, yeah, go ahead, teacher. Uh, yeah, so, um, so this is uh, just the con consequence of um, whatever the calculation you do but from th this equation. And in this equation, of course, we have MK and NL inside. And then when we can get some relations that can replace NL using MK with some projections, then that results in removing NL from this condition. Yeah, I think the, you have written the way you've written your theorem is a little bit incorrect. Uh, I don't, I don't think that. Yeah, that what what you what your MKs probably your MKs are the cross operators for the composite map E star R star, not just E star. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't see how it could only be. Uh, yeah, because if if I'm free to choose whatever R star I want, I can't see how this theorem can hold. So what it, the, the, the way you should have probably formulated is that MKs are the cross operators for the composite map E star, R star, E star. Um, but we, we can talk about this later, yeah. Yeah, so uh, j just one more comment for this, for that. Uh, so if you consider this um, cross representation for composite map, then you should only have only one uh, M here, right? That's what we have seen in noiseless algebra. So yeah. And anyway, we can discuss this afterwards. Okay, so uh, so so this was this is the idea of uh, uh, finding correct over algebra in Heisenberg picture. Now, uh, what's interesting is uh, using this theorem for the finite uh, dimensional matrix algebra, we can uh, see uh, we can see interesting thing. Moreover, this theorem makes a nice transition from the Heisenberg picture to Schrodinger picture. So in this theorem, what it says is that for any star algebra, uh, pick some algebra A, which is D by D complex matrix algebra, um, there is a unitary matrix such that for any A in subalgebra A, it has this structure, and this has this structure of decomposition. Now, <clears throat> well, what this is, is it just has the block diagonals. So the first sector is this, the sec second sector, first sector continues, and you have some uh, in sector. Now this i t r t one here, each i t i this represents the multiplicities of the um, uh, first tensor factor a s one. So for example, if you have um, a tensor i with a two by two matrix identity with Direct sum with E with tensor product just one, which is just nothing. In this case, you have A, A, B. E. And this capital A and B are matrices. So you'll have this form of diagonal matrices. So this theorem says that if you have finite dimensional subalgebra, you can have this structure. Okay, so uh, the noiseless algebra and corrective algebra both are subalgebra, so we can have <coughs> this uh, form of the structure. Okay. okay, so now one more input here is something called interaction algebra. So interaction algebra is generated by cross operators. So E star is given, so you consider uh, the set of cross operators and generate algebra by considering multiplicities in addition to all that. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, now, when you consider a commutant algebra, meaning that the algebra that commutes with noiseless uh, algebra, 
sorry, let me say this again. So here, for example, let's consider uh, commutant algebra of noiseless algebra. Commutant algebra is the algebra that commutes with noise, noiseless algebra or the algebra or whatever. So noiseless algebra here, we have this form. And some, the things that commutes with this structure has this structure now. Now we have identity on the first tensor factor and some matrix on the second uh, tensor factor. So this is the commutant algebra of noiseless algebra. In this case, uh, since we have considered the commutation between the noiseless algebra with the cross operators, this, the algebra generated by cross operators should be inside of this algebra, which has this structure. Okay. So <clears throat> just um, to do the quick check by saying whether <laughs> noiseless algebra is invariant under this channel. So like I discussed, this MK cross operator now has this representation or decomposition. And when we consider the action of E star on A, we have uh, this sum over K, MK, dagger A, MK, where A is from noiseless algebra. So noiseless algebra has uh, this structure with the sum. So if we do this calculation, this MK uh, dagger MK only acts on second uh, tensor factor. And the first tensor factor is left invariant. Well, it doesn't, um, there's nothing to do with the action of E star. Because we know that E star is a unital, this term just uh, this term just becomes identity, which gives you E star of A equals to A. So <clears throat> it checks that the noiseless algebra is invariant under uh, E star. Okay. So um, for the summary, uh, the uh, Heisenberg picture for the con uh, operator quantum error correction is that given E and R, we need to find the correctable algebra that is characterized uh, by the commutation relation between cross operators. Okay, is there any questions so far? So, it's already uh, full, maybe I don't have that much of time. So um, uh, how, how much time can I have for? Or... Hey, I mean, yeah, I don't know. how much time do you need? Um, maybe uh, five to 10 minutes. Ah, yes. yes. Okay, so um, here we're gonna discuss about Schrodinger the picture. So in the Schrodinger picture, uh, given E and R, that's the same for Heisenberg picture. Now we want to find the code subsystem. Okay. And code subsystem is actually a generalization of code subspace, which we will see later soon. So again, just quick review for the Schrodinger picture. Uh, so we have discussed this by looking at the expectation value. In Heisenberg picture, we have focused on this expression now we focus on the left-hand side of this expression here. So, but before we get into the details of Schrodinger picture, let me just quickly describe what the subspace and subsystem is. So subspace here, HI, we consider a direct sum, and this each HI is considered as subspace. Now for the subsystem, we consider a tensor product structure of Hilbert space, and if Hilbert space is this structure, we say that A, a is subsystem or HB as a, as a subsystem. Uh, more in general, you can consider combinations of subsystem and subspace in this following uh, expression. So HI, A tensor HB for a certain, certain I can be considered as a subspace and then HIA or HIB can be subsystem. Now, if the dimension of HIB is one, or it's trivial, then this structure just reduces to subspace, a uh, uh, direct sum of subspace. So HI, HIA now becomes subspace instead of subsystem. 
So from this observation, uh, it's naively you can see that the subsystem is a kind of generalization of subspace. So uh, for example, of subspace and subsystem, we have we can uh, we can look at with the two qubit system. So if you have a two qubit system, H can be decomposed uh, into P space. For example, H zero can be spanned by zero one and one zero. H zero can be spanned by zero zero one one. For the subsystem, if you want to look at the subsystem of these two qubits, you can consider H eight and so H P, which is just simply a single qubit Hilbert space for each. So this is first qubit. This is for second qubit. Okay, so in showing a picture, error acts on the states for density matrices. So let's consider to understand to define cold subspace or find cold subspace. Let's first find noiseless subsystem. So um, given a two qubit system spanned by this structure, so this states, then it, consider error acting on this uh, system. Okay. Now let's say initial state is zero tensor zero. Then error, if the error only acts on the second qubit and does nothing to do the first qubit, then we say that this Hilbert space H1 is noiseless subsystem. Okay. So, uh, so the, let's remember what we have learned from the Heisenberg picture. So in the Heisenberg picture, Given CPTP map E, we were able to find the noiseless algebra AN. A, A now has operator A in noiseless algebra has this structure. And looking at this structure, we can deduce or we can find the structure of density matrices in this way. So in this case, density matrix A here is, can be said as the Density matrices restricted to the algebra, noiseless algebra AN. The intuitive way to uh, do this is you can think of expectation value of row, uh, trace of A of uh, trace of A row. Since A has this structure, it has zeros, uh, a lot of zeros in uh, in many, a lot of zeros of uh, matrix elements. So those zeros do not contribute to the expectation value. So you can remove those matrix elements from density matrices. That's the intuitive way to find the structure of density matrix restricted to a certain algebra. So in this case, if you consider uh, the action of E CPTP map on density matrix here, the, all the noise only acts on the second tensor factor, not the first not the first tensor factor. So the tensor factor, first tensor factor is depth invariant. Okay. And if C given CPT, CPT map is unital, then uh, E of rho A N is uh, is left invariant. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Just a general question. Uh -huh. So the, the talk about subsystems, uh, can you not do this in the Heisenberg picture as well? Or is there any advantage to talk about subsystems in the Schrodinger picture? Oh, uh, in this case, you can explicitly see how this action, how the CPTP map acts on density matrices. That's just it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So in this case, I said the hint to noise subsystem means that the Hilbert space supporting this density matrix rho SI um, um, uh, subsystem that is invariant under this action of CPTP map. So that's but the block diagonal decomposition is the same, right? Whether it's the operator or the density matrix. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So the noiseless subsystem. <clears throat> uh, so now, in order to properly define what the noiseless subsystem is, we need to look at the structure we have in space. So from this sorry, from this structure, the projection we can have the projection, or we can say maybe induced projection from the structure of algebra. And <clears throat> so this uh, we have there is this projection such that a conjugation of this projection on A leaves A itself and also 
leaves density matrix rho an. And this projection has this form. Tensor rho i and i, this is identity on the first tensor factor, identity on the second tensor factor. So in this case, if you act this projection onto the whole Hilbert space, you can have this uh, decomposition of Hilbert space. In this case, because we have seen that this rho si was in there, the first tensor factor was invariant under the uh, CPTP map, we say that this hsi uh, of certain i is a uh, noiseless subsystem. So this is the form, uh, the def definition of the subsystem. So <clears throat> here now uh, we consider a subspace in this D, uh, H. It's H S I tensor say H D I. And now we think of isometry B, which maps from uh, eight, sorry, this H, this is equal to H I. Sorry about that. This is equal to H I. And so B is isometry map from sub, uh, subspace to, um, sorry, P. D H, oh no, no, no. So, sorry, sorry, okay. Subspace to whole Hilbert space. Now, the uh, subsystem HSI is said to be noiseless subsystem if this holds. So this action of E only acts on the second tensor factor and tau Ti is some density matrix on the se second tensor factor here. And especially if the dimension of HDI is one, HSI becomes noiseless subspace or it sometimes called as the coherence free subspace. Okay. Sorry, is, is yeah. tau ti e of sigma ti? Uh, e. Or, or, or. No, no. Mm, it's a little bit more complicated because we have isometry here. Okay. Yeah. So, in the same sense, we can define correctable subsystem, or we can say the we can say cold subsystem. So in this case, uh, given CPTP map E and R, we, we had correctable algebra. And also from this, in the same uh, discussion as we did in the noiseless algebra, we can find the structure of density matrices, the matrices and Hilbert space in this decomposition. In this case, with the same uh, definition as noiseless subsystem, we can <laughs> have this definition, consider subspace HS10 HDI with isometry. If, sorry, if the first term is left invariant, then HSI is said to be um, correctable subsystem or called subsystem. But the, the, on, only the difference between correctable subsystem and noiseless subsystem is whether you have this R in this equation, as you see here. Okay. So again, called subsystem as a generalization of called subspace, consider a subspace in this way, HSI is called subsystem. And if dimension of HDI is the one, then HSI is a called subspace. Okay. So for the summary, Heisenberg picture, we have given two CPTP maps, find the correctable algebra. And for Schrodinger picture, given same two CPTP maps, find called subsystem. Okay. So since it's out of time, um, I'm not gonna go through examples, but uh, we can uh, do uh, these uh, construction of correctable algebra and uh, uh, construction of correctable algebra codes and also called subsystem uh, explicitly using these examples. Okay. So yeah, again, the conclusions, we have looked at active quantum error correction which uh, cold subspace and CPTP map are given and find the recovery map. For uh, passive quantum error correction, we had two pictures, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, and they are first given two CPTP maps and find correctable algebra or cold subsystem. Okay. So for the future work, uh, it would be nice to look at these things, this formalism and holography 
and yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any question? I have one question. Like in the uh, ADS picture that you had. Yes. I think if you want to say that this little thing in the middle with the phi is the correct average or something because it commutes the phi of x in the middle in this triangle uh -huh. this commutes one. or something. So is that that would be the correct average or something? Um. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Mm. I not sure. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, so uh, here you have to think about it this way that this op the information content of the operator phi x is not destroyed under the action of operators that are localized only in A1 or localize only in A2 or localize only in A3. If you act with any of such operators, there's always a recovery map that recovers all the expectation values of operator phi of x. So phi of x acts, acts and lives is a map from the logical subspace to the logical subspace. So it's a logical operator. I see. Okay. So, so I don't understand what is this logical operator we... Ah, so logical operators are operators that act on logical spaces that we have discussed. So, yeah. So my understanding is that the way the people define the logical space or called subspace in holography is that they pick these uh, operators, logical operators, and then acting on the uh, kind of a vacuum in this called subspace or logical space to span Hilbert space. Of it. So it has some degrees of freedom. So Martin, in, in summary, if you have a state that you have prepared in your laboratory and you just, the state is sitting there, now, this is an open quantum system, so errors happen all the time. Your state might be destroyed, right? This is the memory, right? So you have to constantly go back and correct for errors, right? That's just error correction. Now, um, if, you, if you know what errors can happen, you pick your state to live, to come from the, uh, from the, correct, from the subspace that's protected so that these errors could be corrected. So that's just one setup. Now, let's say you wanna actually build a quantum computer. Now, this time you wanna actually act with sigma x on your qubit, and this time it's not an error, right? But what you want to have is that your initial state has to be correctable, has to be immune to errors, and your final state has to be immune to errors. So it's a map from the correctable subspace to the correctable subspace. That's what the logical operator is. But you could build your computer with operators which are not corrected also, I guess, so. Well, yes, but that you very quickly lose track of what you're trying to, what, what you're trying to simulate. You want both your states and operations that you want, you're trying to simulate to be immune to errors or at least correctable with respect to errors. No, no, I mean, the, like suppose you had this, uh, he had this code with like nine qubits. So the computer will flip the zero to one, but the full guy zero to the full guy one, but that cannot be corrected. Yeah, every error correction, well, there are, so in that example that he gave, uh, you have partial correction. So your, your state is correct, uh, is protected against certain errors with a problem, there's a success probability. There's always a chance that you get unlucky and uh, there is some error. 
But what you want to do is that you want that to be very, very unlikely. In classical computers, we also have errors, but they are very, very unlikely. No, but what I mean is that the, you correct certain spin flips errors, but the computer doesn't use those as operation. It uses some other operations which are not correctable. Yeah. Which are not correctable? Sorry. I don't... Yeah, suppose you flip a local spin, that is correctable. But if you flip like nine spins at the same time, your cor error correction doesn't correct that, and that's a co operation that the computer will use to operate. That's right, but you want to find those operations in a full setup, you want to find those operations that are optimal for that, right? Because you say, suppose I apply sigma x and I don't want to correct it, but you probably don't want to apply sigma x, you want to apply something, else. that's the only thing else. No, no, so, so let's say, so can you, teacher, can you go to the example of three encoding using one to three? No, no, you just passed it. Encoding using three qubits to encode one. Oh, okay. Yeah, here. So now, his zero L and one L are logical qubits. What these are, this is just notation for zero, zero, zero and one, one, one. So now your sigma X logical is the operator that sends zero, zero, zero to one, one, one and one, one, one to zero, zero, zero. That's your Yeah, and that's what I say, that's not correct. So if that happened by mistake, you kind of correct it. Yeah. Of but, course, of course. Yeah, yeah. That's a logical operator. I mean, there's always, you can, the, so the, the setup you're saying that is that there always has to be, you can, you can at best protect against a set of operators that are not uh, generating the whole algebra. So let's say your errors, MKs, they generate an algebra that uh, Kichur called it interaction algebra. If this interaction algebra is all, oper all operators in your algebra, there's no way you could protect against that. I mean, his, his setup just trivializes. His interaction, his uh, protected subalgebra is just identity. That's the only thing you can correct for in that setup. So you always have to assume your errors are just one, two, three. These are three options that can happen and not everything is error. Not everything can happen. 